Okay, um, so welcome to Immune Zoom. And this week, uh, it's my great honor uh, to introduce Dr. Han Rui Zhang uh, from Columbia uh, uh, as our speaker. So some, back, some background about Han Rui. Uh, she obtained her PhD in University of Missouri under the mentorship of Cui Hua Zhang and Mike Hill. Her PhD work focused on the crosstalk between immune cells and the blood vessels in diabetes. Then she moved on to do a postdoc with Mudak Riley in Penn and then in Columbia, where she investigated the mechanism of cardiometabolic diseases uh, by focusing on macrophage. In 2018, Henry started her own lab in the Department of Medicine in Columbia University Medical Center. Her lab focused on the mechanism and the therapeutic implications of macrophage heterogeneity and plasticity in cardiometabolic disease. Uh, I think one of the biggest challenges uh, in studying macrophage function in human disease uh, is the difficulty to, uh, in, to genetically manipulate macrophages, uh, which are usually derived from monocyte or cell lines. And uh, uh, these differentiated macrophages uh, cannot be expanded very well. So Henry uh, uh, really uh, take this uh, hard piece and manage it to uh, solve the problem by using patient-derived iPSCs followed by differentiation into macrophages uh, on which she can do uh, a much more efficient uh, CRISPR-based gene editing. Using these tools, Henry conducted a, a genome-wide screen and identified a few novel regulators for aphrocytosis. Uh, I think Henry uh, will tell us more about this in a second. Unsurprisingly, uh, Henry has been awarded uh, with numerous prestigious awards, including the NIH K99, uh, Arwen Page Junior Faculty Research Award, and the Poor Dudley White International Scholar Award. Uh, she has also done uh, many service jobs, uh, including um, serving uh, as reviewers for NIH study sections and the American Heart Association uh, fellowships and grants. Uh, without further ado, Henry, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Xiaolei, for the really kind and thorough introduction. Uh, and thanks for inviting me. I was just talking with Xiaolei and Chuan. It's amazing that this seminar series has been going on for almost two years now. And then speaker Lana Pendil, early 2023. It's, it's really such a invaluable platform. And I'm so honored to be part of it now today to share our work. Um, I started my lab uh, about four years ago. Like It's actually surprising that time really flew by. Um, when I started my lab, I, I was interested and I'm still interested, but at that time I had that resolution that I was interested in the role of macrophage in cardiometabolic diseases, but I wanted to have that niche of functional genomics in my program. So this is how I'm gonna uh, start, start talking about all the research project in, in my lab uh, without focusing specifically on, on one particular complete story because I feel like it's just a good opportunity for me to share in general who we are and what we are doing. And this is my lab's web page. Uh, I'd like to particularly highlight the resource tab. I call myself a cell biologist and my lab is mostly wet, but we have uh, a large dry components. We analyze all of our data by ourselves, including bulk and single cell RNA seq, CRISPR screening, and functional genomic data as well. So I'm a big advocate of open science, and we share our workflow in great details with the community. And many of the workflows are available under the resource tab. So I just want to uh, highlight it. Uh, please feel free to look at our resource. Uh, let us know if there's any uh, potential opportunities we can contribute and collaborate. So basically under the big theme of macrophage biology in cardiometabolic diseases, uh, my lab has uh, three research areas all related to functional genomics. First of all, we are 
really enthusiastic about leveraging human genomic discoveries to identify candidate genes contribute to uh, cardiometabolic diseases uh, genetically. So in particular, uh, we are interested in a gene called LIPE. It's a risk locus for coronary artery disease. Uh, the second direction uh, is about using unbiased functional genomic screening to identify novel regulators for important macrophage function. Uh, for, for this particular direction, we are now, now focusing on discovering novel regulators of macrophage aphrocytosis using CRISPR screening. Uh, and then thanks for Xiaolei uh, mentioning that well, another major expertise we have is human IPS differentiation to macrophages. I established that protocol uh, during my postdoctoral training uh, and I used that protocol to model human disease um, because um, as Xiaolei already um, kind of mentioned, it's really difficult to genetically manipulate human primary monocyte and macrophages. By using IPS-derived macrophages and coupled with per gene editing, we can either use patient-derived IPS cells, or we can use CRISPR to knock in the mutation or correct the mutation to differentiate them to macrophages and study disease-relevant uh, mechanisms. We can also use this as a model to study human-specific non-coding regulatory elements that are really, really important but cannot be studied in other model uh, organisms because those are just not conserved. So this is also the main area that we, uh, we serve as a collaborator for others' grants applications and, and a research project. I would like to bring it up. Um, I'll be happy to contribute to any collaborative efforts. So please feel free to um, message me if you are interested. Uh, so for today, I'm gonna talk about two stories uh, for each of the research area as an example, just to show like how, how we leverage those functional genomic resources and techniques to uh, perform mechanistic translational study. First, uh, we, use the functional genomic and molecular biology techniques to try to connect the genetic variants associated with increased risk of human coronary artery disease uh, to the function of the candidate genes. Uh, why, why we are even interested in that? Why we even bother to, to, um, to do GWA or try to follow up the GWA uh, genetic evidence? This is because any candidate genes with human genomic evidence supporting that uh, association are actually twice more likely to become an approved medication. And therefore, like uh, there's a big premise to focus on candidate genes uh, supported by human genomic discoveries in order to discover novel mechanisms and then also discover potential new therapeutic targets. This is important also because coronary artery disease remains to be the leading cause of death. It remains so uh, based on the 2022 American Heart Association statistics. And coronary artery disease is inheritable. And so far, GWAS has discovered more than 200 loci associated with uh, CAD risk. But the functional genomic study to connect those genetic variants in those loci to the candidate gene and function significantly lag, preventing us from leveraging this genomic discovery to understand the disease better. And as I kind of already mentioned, by studying those candidate genes, we can discover novel mechanisms uh, and finding potential the new therapeutic targets. So basically, the whole goal is to find the GWA catalog, identify the variants, and then try to use functional genomics and molecular biology techniques to, to connect them to the target gene uh, and then the functional impact of those genes and try to explain why those genes uh, contribute to disease risk. In that case, we are interested in a gene called LIPE. Uh, it's a risk locus for coronary artery disease. 
has been repeatedly validated by multiple GWAS as listed here. What's interesting about this gene is it's not associated with lipid trace. It's known as a lipase in the lysosome. It regulates lipid metabolism, but it's not associated with lipid trace, which are a known cardiovascular risk factor. Uh, this um, provide some hint that that gene must be regulating some CAD specific mechanisms, um, suggesting very interest, uh, interest uh, stories behind. So unlike, unlike other candidate genes uh, inspired by GWAS that are often in the middle of nowhere of the genome and then has very little known, LIPE is actually a very well studied gene. Like it, it has been heavily studied. You can find many papers. It is known as a lysosoma assay lipase. It's famous because it's the only known uh, lipase that hydrolyzed cholesterol ester and triglyceride uh, delivered to the lysosome um, the uptake of lipoprotein by cells. So lipoprotein gets into the cell and then gets delivered to the lysosome to break down and then the, the metabolite can be used by the cells. And so it's really, really important. Because of that, the loss of function mutation of lipase actually cause severe and well-known Mendelian disorders because basically the neutral lipids being taken up by the cells will just accumulate in the lysosome, in liver, uh, also in immune cells and cause hyperlipidemia, liver failure, and premature coronary artery disease, uh, presumably because of the severe death lipidemia. And here is just a brief diagram showing that the lipoprotein will get into the lysosome. Without the lipase, the lipid will just accumulate in the lysosome, and anything else highlighted here would not happen. So for the lipase CAD risk allele, those are not code invariant. There is no evidence that they cause loss of function mutation, and they are also intronic, and they are common, and they are not associated with lipid trace. The questions we, we were trying to ask were really, is LIPE truly the causal gene? And then what are the causal variants that are associated with CAD risk and then affect the LIPE gene, the expression and activity, and what are the causal tissue and cell type responsible for these effects? And how does the LIPE expression uh, affected by the genetic variants associated with CAD risk would impact atherosclerosis? which is the cause of coronary artery diseases. So we try to tackle those questions uh, in our story. Basically, uh, one type of functional genomic analysis is called co-localization analysis. Uh, the, this is a complicated plot, but all it's showing is that we want to find evidence that the genetic variants associated with coronary artery diseases are the same genetic variants associated with lipase expression. So when we see that, like we, we can go look that, that is, there's co-localization as being sort of virilized here. And this kind of evidence support lipase is a causal gene and the genetic variants associated with increased risk are affecting the genetic determination through affecting lipase expression. So there's reasonable evidence to suggest that lipase is the causal gene, and then what are the causal tissue and cell type? Basically, this EQTL has only been found in, um, in a strong uh, statistical significance in whole blood and spleen and visceral adipose tissue. And then other tissue uh, seem to show very weak signal, making us hypothesize that on this, this regulation, this regulation of the genetic variants are mostly about immune cells. So by leveraging blueprint uh, consortium data, we really need a big consortium data in order to do this type of study. We were able to confirm that among different type of immune cells, the EQTL signal are the most significant monocytes, but not in neutrophil T cells. And then monocytes can differentiate to macrophages and using the StarNet consortium data, we were able to confirm that there is lipase EQTL very strong signal in macrophages. So it seems like based on all those evidence, uh, this genetic variants affect the lipase expression in monocytes and macrophages in a pretty cell type specific way. 
And not surprising that lipid is important for lysosomal lipid metabolism. And then the human protein atlas data also uh, supported that like lipid was the most abundantly expressed in tissue resident macrophages in different organs and also in monocyte derived macrophages. Uh, and monocytes is not a cell type that abundantly express a lipid, but we also do see EQTL signal. So basically this just suggests that both monocytes and macrophages are highly promising to be the causal cell type responsible for this genetic association and the regulatory effects of the genetic variants. And then we, with our own biobank, we were able to confirm that the risk allele carriers uh, show the higher lipid mRNA and the enzymatic activity. It is a lipase, so the activity matters the most uh, are higher like um, in the risk allele carriers. Uh, also, we saw the consistent trend in the protein level. Basically, this is just suggested that the genetic variants that led to uh, that are associated with increased CD risk led to higher lipase mRNA and the enzymatic activity, specifically in monocytes and macrophages. Um, usually, the next question is very functional genomic uh, focused. So, people would try to figure out which exact genetic variants were regulating the lipase expression. So, the typical way would be to look at the genome browser view for the uh, histone modification and, and uh, uh, transcription factor bending and look for evidence that the candidate uh, functional variant would overlap with the, the P, so called the signal, the strongest signal and evidence of bending and histone modification. So you found those two regions are the most interesting. Uh, posting the genetic variants in high linkage disequilibrium or with the GVA risk variants. So this is another layer of information, but just try not to overwhelm uh, everybody too much basically. So the GVA are, are based on association. And, and then when you see a genetic variance showing the strongest statistical association, it doesn't mean that variant is the functional one because there are multiple variants in that locus are just associated with the particular um, genotype of that variant. So any variant um, associated with that lead SNP can be the functional one uh, just because of the statistical method were not able to identify that, which has to be validated functionally. So after pinning down those two regions, we were able to show that only the 1412444 region, which is right here, has the enhancer activity. And we were able to use high resolution, high C uh, through collaboration to show that this particular region hosting three variants, all likely to be the functional variant, uh, has a chromatin interaction with the promoter region of lipase. So this deeper and deeper layer of information now begin to suggest that those three variants are most likely the functional ones. And then this interaction are specific in monocytes. We don't see interaction in T cells, which is really nice to be able to have that negative data uh, to, to con further confirm the EQTL association. Um, the previous data are all about association, and here we were able to use site-directed mutagenesis to causally prove that when we introduced the risk alleles for the three variant in that enhancer region, the enhancer activity are higher uh, compared with the non-risk alleles, the particular haplotype. Uh, and then mechanistically, the risk allele are showing increased binding, increased binding. Uh, here, the red color indicating the risk allele uh, with the PO1 transcription factor. And then one of the variant within this region, uh, basically with the risk allele, it introduced a bending site uh, showing this increased bending. So we saw those evidence, we were able to confirm that the variant 445 as showing here and the variant 496 are most likely to be the functional variant uh, having additive effects to regulate lipase expression. 
So once I start to talk about that, like sometimes people, including myself, began to think, is it really important to know that? So like basically we are not gonna edit any human being to try to change a light pay uh, expression. Uh, it is not so important uh, in terms of how we can manipulate the late this genetic variant, but those kind of evidence is very important in order to be uh, sure, in order to be sure that lipase is the causal gene uh, for this locus, and then the genetic variants associated with the CAD risk are regulating the genetic determinants um, by regulating lipase expression. So this is the whole point of functional genomics. Now we know the causal genes lipase, uh, causal tissue type of monocytes and macrophages, and then higher risk are associated with higher lipase. So higher is not good, although no lipase is bad as well. And then the next step is to move to preclinical model in order to establish the causality. So basically the whole idea is that we generate a monocyte and macrophage specific lipase overexpression mouse model and determine how that impact atherosclerosis. That will ultimately establish the causality of this locus. So what we were able to do is we, we uh, knock in this uh, to construct into the ROSA locus of the C57 BL6 um, ES cells. Uh, and then by, by cross this mice with the Lysam Cray, uh, the Cray recombinase will remove the LUXP flank to stop codon. Uh, the lipase will then be expressed. And then because there is a GIP reporter, we can use it to confirm that lipase uh, is indeed overexpressed in myeloid specific manner. So we generated this mice and then we were able to confirm increased mRNA and enzyme activity uh, with the lysam cre mediated myeloid cell specific overexpression. So the overexpression is very modest, as you can probably recognize in peritoneal macrophages and in bone marrow derived macrophages, which are the very uh, typical macrophage model uh, people use. So, but the but the key point is that this effect size is what we observe in human subjects. And so, basically, with with the macrophages from riscolio carriers, we also see modest increase. So, we think um, for the nature of this model it really just resemble what we are seeing in human. So we decided to continue to evaluate how that impact atherosclerosis. And what we are seeing is indeed in both female and male mice with lipase overexpression in a myeloid specific manner, uh, we saw increased allelian size as we realized here and there. And then it didn't affect the lipid trace. It didn't affect total cholesterol and other parameters, which are not showing here, basically are consistent with uh, human genomic discoveries. And then we, we, we try to find out how the lesion will change. We tested many things about uh, what's the most dramatic phenotype is that we saw increased macrophage area with lipase overexpression in myeloid cells, uh, which, is expected and consistent with increased allelian size. And then we were wondering if it is all about the number game where those macrophages had, had a different subpopulation distribution, which can be tested by the recent advancement of single cell transcriptomics uh, technology. So indeed we obtained a aorta and then we separated the cells uh, from lipid transgenic mice to GFP positive and GFP negative. So the caveat here is that like the less amicry mediated overexpression is never 100% efficient. So even though the mice are lipid transgenic, uh, only part of the cells are overexpressing lipase. And we, we separate them so that like we can directly compare within the same cohort of mice with or without lipase expression, how that will actually impact macrophage subpopulation distribution. So long story short, without showing all the plots, the conclusion here is that like we, we saw with lipase overexpression, uh, there is change uh, in terms of subpopulation distribution. Uh, we saw 
the trying to hide foamy macrophages uh, show the lower proportion with lipo expression. And at the same time, we saw increased proportion of inflammatory macrophages and so-called resident-like macrophages. So we found it was, it was interesting. At that time, we, we really didn't have an explanation, but we decided to start from validating this single cell discovery because after all, the foamy, which means lipid accumulated foamy-like, um, is inferred based on transcriptomic data, not by functional assays. So the first experiment we did after that was we tried to determine the neutral lipid accumulation in plaque macrophages uh, from control and uh, transgenic mice. And I didn't mention both are on LDRR background, not uh, LDRR knockout background, which is a very standard model to study atherosclerosis because wild type mice don't develop atherosclerosis. So basically we were able to show that neutral lipid accumulation were lower with slight pale expression in the plaque macrophages, which is consistent with the single cell RNA-seq funding. We also found a lower lipid accumulation in peritoneal macrophages. So it's not like specific to the plaque macrophages. And then we were wondering why. So basically we were able to uh, test for, for the phenotype that lower lipid accumulation, it can be caused by decreased uptake or increased efflux. So we were able to have some evidence showing that the efflux were not changed, but we were able to confirm that the uptake were reduced as supported here. And then we were able to uh, use RNA-seq and qPCR to show that it was because of decreased expression of several genes responsible for uh, uptake of modified lipoprotein. So both the ex, ex vivo and in vitro data uh, at least explained why we see less foamy macrophages. Uh, and then because of the higher proportion of inflammatory macrophages, we also performed a pathway analysis to see which pathway were affected among the so-called inflammatory macrophages, we were able to show that the chemokine signaling were predicted to be activated in lipid or expressing plaque macrophages. It was extremely hard to try to confirm that by qPCR because it was such a small amount of material, but we could at least confirm that lipid was indeed higher in the transgenic mice plaque macrophages, and we saw higher CCL4, which is a key uh, chemokine. And then we were able to see an overall increase, not statistically significant, but overall increased pattern of chemokines in the plasma, suggesting increased inflammation. So basically, I mean, the, the next question should be what are the mechanisms, like why that has happened? But it's actually very, very challenging to address that. We had some hypotheses, basically, uh, with the single cell technology, the field has recognized already that the foamy macrophages, the lipid accumulated macrophages are less inflammatory. Uh, because we see reduced proportion of foamy macrophages and then the other subpopulations that are more inflammatory uh, had higher proportion. So we think that it's about that, uh, it's about that shift it's also about that when the cells are less lipid accumulated, uh, maybe certain pathways are activated and let them to become more inflammatory. So these are something like we still try to try to dissect further. Um, but overall, we think even by this point, we, we address an important knowledge gap in the field because in the past, uh, there were no study really dissected this low side to show what are the risk allele, what are the risk var uh, genetic variants, how they affected lipase in which tissue, and we were able to show that it was the risk allele led to increase the lipase in macrophage and monocytes. And then we were able to establish the causality that myeloid-specific overexpression 
led to reduced foaming macrophages while increased inflammation and ultimately increased atherosclerosis. So this is consistent with the human functional genomic uh, level association studies. Uh, suggest to the field that although, although lipase is essential, it's important in regulating lysosomal lipid catabolism, higher lipase is not necessarily a good thing. This is really just what we were able to provide to the field. So uh, in, the, in the future, and also part of the current study, we try to determine increased lipase in other cell type. This is not about functional genomics at all because functional genomics data showing that the genetic variants only regulate lipid expression in monocyte macrophages. But we are curious how this important lipid catabolism gene, the only known lysosomal lipase, uh, can regulate uh, met lipid metabolism in other cell types related to cardiometabolic diseases as a fundamental physiology type of study. And then this is just one example uh, but studying this one gene, we get to explore all the resources. Now we are really motivated to systematically define tissue and cell type specific gene genetic contribution to CD, in particular uh, by monocytes and macrophages. We have a few other candidate genes we are interested in exploring further. So hopefully we can we can give a bigger picture sometime soon. Now the next story. Um, I'm switching gear a little bit. It's about a gene called WDFY3. It's a novel regulator of macrophage aphrocytosis as discovered by genome-wide CRISPR screening. Um, the story is now on bioarchive. So please feel free to, to like, look at it if you're interested. And I'll try to be brave about this story because it's made available to the community already. So basically why we, we care about macrophage aphrocytosis. Aphrocytosis is a term to describe a phagocytosis of apoptotic cells by phagocytes, mainly macrophages. So phagocytes can engulf many things and then the engulfment of apoptotic cells is termed as aphrocytosis. It is very important in maintaining tissue homeostasis. Uh, we turn around many, many apoptotic cells uh, on a daily basis, all those needs to be cleared away in order to avoid uh, secondary necrosis and the subsequent severe inflammation. Because of that, defective aphrocytosis drives many diseases. Uh, it is already known that therapeutics to enhance aphrocytosis uh, are promising in clinical studies to improve cancer prognosis and suppress vascular information. So understanding more about this uh, pathway, uh, this important macrophage function can have broad impact on many diseases. Uh, we already know a lot about this process. So basically the phagocytes need to find the apoptotic cells, they need to bind uh, and then trigger the mechanical sensor mechanism to engulf and then degraded the cargo. So the macrophage can be ready to, to take up another apoptotic cells and continue and continue. However, so far there were no unbiased screening using apoptotic cells as the substrate uh, and then using primary macrophages as the effector cells to try to discover novel regulators. This is important because uh, for most of the CRISPR screening were done in a tumor cell line. Because the cell lines are not physiological cell type already, and they already have pretty poor capacity to engulf apoptotic cells. So the discovery would not be as reliable. And this is also confirmed by our CRISPR screening. So without going through the details, basically the most important thing for a successful CRISPR screening would be to ensure efficient gene editing, which is very easy to understand, to start from a lot of cells. We started from uh, 500 million bone marrow cells uh, in order to have sufficient power, and then to be able to uh, sort the cells and enrich for, for the non-eaters that have poor aphrocytosis capacity, so basically didn't eat at all, and then the so-called efficient eaters that engulf the fluorescently labeled apoptotic cells uh, in two sequential rounds. 
one round labeled by red, one round labeled by green. So those macrophages that engulf the two cells turn out to be yellow because the two fluorescence uh, both present in the macrophages, meaning that the macrophages ate two apoptotic cells in the two rounds. So it's all about enrichment and, and um, about informatic analysis using the existing package. And then in the end, we were able to, as illustrated here, identify many known uh, regulator of aphrocytosis, which is really cool, meaning that our platform was successful. And then WDFS3 is, is a novel one. It's a novel one that has never been implicated for the for aphrocytosis or phagocytosis of other substrates like uh, yeast, is uh, what has been studied before. Uh, and this one I wanted to highlight because it was a novel one when we finished our screening, but last year was published to regulate aphrocytosis. So it's not novel anymore, but it's actually cool that we discover something that um, the field later on found it, it can be validated. So we were able to have a good collaborator who studied the role of WDFS3 in neurological cell types so that we uh, took the advantage and crossed them to let them create for myeloid specific knockout. And we were able to confirm that knockout impaired aphrocytosis. And we were able to confirm that the binding was not compromised. So basically the macrophages can bind with the apoptotic cell while without WDFS3, it was the internalization process slowed down uh, with the knockout of WDFS3. So this is the time required uh, from binding until complete engulfment, which is longer with the knockout of WDFS3. And then this is a video visualizing this process. So the arrow point to an apoptotic cells and the green color are the affecting. So as you can see, the phagocytic cup form right here, and then the affecting remodel to uh, wrap up the apoptotic cells, and then pull it in for complete engulfment. And then I also hope you recognize that, like once the engulfment happen, the affecting actually uh, signal actually decrease, meaning that the affecting depolymerized. Uh, this is an important highlight because we think actin polymerization is important for internalization, but it's actually not just about polymerization. It's about a dynamic cycle of polymerization and depolymerization so that the actin, actin can continue to remodel and have the sufficient um, mechanical force to engulf in a big substrate uh, like apoptotic cells which is almost the same size as the macrophage itself. And what we found was really, really interesting is that we found that the actin polymerization process were not really impaired. It was the depolymerization process. So basically what's showing here is that like in wild type cells, as soon as this uh, blue color labeled apoptotic cells were completely engulfed, you don't really see the red affecting ring anymore. But with the WDFS3 knockout, we see a much higher frequency of this affecting surrounded cargo, which are already being uh, engulfed, but the affecting uh, does not depolymerize. So this suggests a delayed and inefficient process. So we reasoned that this delayed depolymerization may lead to impaired degradation because uh, it is known that the uh, affecting needs to disassemble in order for the cargo to fuse with the lysosome. Um, but we were also curious to leverage what's already known for WDFS3. In fact, the WDFS3 was known to regulate uh, autophagic clearance of aggregated protein. So the C-terminal bands with uh, the P62 and other autophagy machinery uh, to deliver the protein aggregates to the lysosome for degradation. So we hypothesized that like maybe WDFI3 also serves as this bridging molecule to bridge apoptotic cells being engulfed and the autophagy machinery leads to lysosomal phagosome fusion and the degradation. So we try to test this hypothesis. 
And indeed, we see impaired fragmentation. So there are more non-fragmented engulfed apoptotic cells with knockout. And then we were able to confirm that that was impaired uptake. Yes. And then for the macrophages already engulfed apoptotic cells, the efficiency of acidification was impaired, meaning that it's not all about uptake, it's about impaired lysosome acidification. And we were able to confirm that it was the LC3 lipidation, the last step required of phagosome lysosome fusion before lysosome can degrade the engulfed material were impaired with the knockout of WDFI3. And then we also saw that WDFI3 is co-localized with LC3. Um, the LC3 is fused with GFP and the WDFI3 was overexpressed by lantivirus. Um, so basically showing that when then apoptotic cells labeled as blue engulfed, uh, there's, uh, there's a co-localization of the two molecule supporting uh, the effects on LC3 lipidation. And there's direct protein-protein interaction between WDFI3 and LC3. So all these evidence put together supporting that WDFI3 affects acting depolymerization efficiency as well as LC3 lipidation to regulate degradation. Um, we try to determine if this is about the entire WDFI3 protein or it's about the functional domain known to regulate the degradation of protein aggregates. So we overexpressed the C-terminal WDFI3 and we were able to confirm that like the C-terminal WDFI3 did not affect uptake. So with our expression of the C-terminal WDFI3, uptake was not rescued, um, but acidification was partly rescued and LC3 lipidation was almost entirely rescued. Supporting that the C-terminal WDFI3 is required for degradation, uh, but the, the full length WDFI3 is required for the uptake. This slide is busy uh, for purpose. I try to show that uh, we, we try to establish the in vivo relevance by using two models of in vivo aphrocytosis, um, but the reviewers still want more. Uh, so it's actually really challenging to get a story uh, published um, in, uh, in the most rigorous way, but we are, we are pursuing that highest standard. So basically here, I'm just trying to show that we injected apoptotic cells to the peritoneal cavity of both control and knockout mice. And then we collected the peritoneal lavage and quantified the percentage of macrophages engulfed in apoptotic cells. And this percentage was lower in the WDFS3 knockout mice, supporting that it is not just an in vitro phenotype, knockout did impair aphrocytosis in vivo. Uh, and then in terms of disease relevance, uh, we analyzed the published data and found it's really interesting that in the atherosclerotic plaque, there's only a quite small subpopulation of the plaque macrophages express WDFI3. Um, and that, as you can imagine, you want the plaque macrophages to have high efficiency of aphrocytosis in order to clear away the dying cells in the plaque to limit its progression. Uh, so smaller percentage is considered to be not good if we do think this WDFS3 high macrophages is protective, but we do observe that with plaque regression, when the plaque is getting smaller, the percentage of this WDFS3 high macrophages increased. So give us some confidence to uh, hypothesize a protective role of WDFS3 in atherosclerosis. And in human plaque, WDFI3 is highly correlated with so-called M2-like protective anti-inflammatory macrophages as well. And then inflammatory stimulation inhibited WDFI3 expression. So this is ongoing work. We, we try to determine the role of WDFI3 in atherosclerosis, which is also supported by uh, phenomide association studies showing WDFI3 now mutations are associated with uh, some atherosclerosis phenotype. So we think there's enough human genomic evidence to, uh, 
to prompt us to test this hypothesis for the role of WDF by three atherosclerosis. So to summarize, here is a schematic figure. Basically, WDF by three is required for the efficient uh, affecting dynamics. And then also the fusion of phagosome with the lysosome. Uh, without WDF by three, uh, affecting depolymerization was not efficient and there is inefficient phagosome lysosomal fusion. So by doing a CRISPR screening, we identified a novel regulator and some novel mechanism that has never been discovered before and would very unlikely to be discovered without performing this type of unbiased screening because people just wouldn't even think of that a gene can have such a dramatic phenotype. And then in terms of ongoing and future studies, so we are, we are still interested, very interested in the molecular mechanism. So basically how, how uh, WDFS3 can regulate actin depolymerization. And now we have some preliminary data showing its role in atherosclerosis, accelerated aging and lupus-like diseases. Uh, this is where I, uh, I think it's getting into the immunology field a little bit more, which I haven't been um, very into in the past because I was more uh, studying cardiometabolic diseases. <clears throat> and then we know some uh, human now mutations in WDFS3, we try to model. Uh, the, model them in IPS derived macrophages. Uh, we are interested in other screening hits as shown in that volcano plot. We're also trying to uh, use this platform, which we think is really very powerful. It allows unbiased screening at genome-wide scale in primary macrophages relevant to physiology to perform additional screening to discover uh, regulators uh, for the specific step of hypercytosis that is the degradation. So we think degradation of the engulfing material is very important because macrophage cannot just keep eating, it has to digest so that it can be ready to continue to engulf. So coming back to the big picture, I think it's about the time as well. So basically my group uh, is enthusiastic at leveraging human genomic discoveries and using human functional genomic screening to identify novel candidate genes and novel regulators for mechanistic studies and, and also use human IPS derived macrophages as a tool for translation. So uh, my lab is actually pretty small and this is um, the view of the Columbia Medical Campus and my lab is right into here. So uh, it's, a, it's a pretty, uh, tall building and many, many labs. Uh, and But uh, it's a good environment. And I have many collaborators, um, especially for functional genomic studies. You really just need a resource for this to happen. So yeah, that's it. Thank you again for listening and for inviting me. OK.